Why does holiness to the Lord appear on LDS temples? History, meaning, and purpose. Why does holiness to the Lord appear on LDS temples? Was the phrase used on buildings anciently? These ruins near the Jerusalem Temple Mount may have been part of a complex of fortifications that King Solomon constructed in Jerusalem, quote, until he had made an end of building his own house and the house of the Lord and the wall of Jerusalem round about. The Wikipedia article on LDS temples asserts that the phrase holiness to the Lord was inscribed on the Old Testament Temple of Solomon. However, so far as we know, the phrase was never used as part of any ancient building. It is unique to modern temples. In this presentation, we will address three questions. How did the practice of inscribing LDS temples with the words holiness to the Lord begin? What was the meaning of the phrase in the Old Testament? And what is the purpose of modern temples? We'll begin our discussion of history with Kirtland and then move on to Nauvoo, Salt Lake City, and the Washington Monument. The Kirtland House of the Lord prominently displays this inscription tablet over the entrance. However, the words holiness to the Lord, included on every other LDS temple, are missing. That said, there is no question but that Joseph Smith considered the temple a place of holiness. His dedicatory prayer included an entreaty that all people who shall enter upon the threshold of the Lord's house may feel thy power and feel constrained to acknowledge that it is thy house, a place of thy holiness. The original drawings of the Nauvoo Temple do not show an inscription plaque on the facade. However, in 1845, Brigham Young directed the temple architect to place a stone in the west end of the temple with the inscription, Holiness to the Lord, thereon. The application of the phrase to the temple reflected the song of the psalmist, Holiness becometh thy house, O Lord, forever. Thomas L. Kane, who visited Nauvoo in 1846, felicitously compared the entablature on the front to a baptismal mark on the forehead. Details of the inscription as it appears on the reconstructed Nauvoo Temple are shown here. The date of April 6, 1841 that had been selected for the groundbreaking recalled the anniversary of the organization of the church in 1830. Unlike the inscription above, the words on the original temple were gilt. The photograph at left shows the dedicatory inscription for the Salt Lake Temple. The inscription, set beneath cloud stones, symbolizes the reality of the establishment of God's kingdom on earth, with the temple as his personal sanctuary, where heaven and earth are joined in, joined in perfect order. It is also the place, as are any of the temples, where the inhabitants of Zion, or those pure in heart, can gather and be taught of light and truth. A house to which he may come, or send his messengers, confer priesthood and keys, and to give revelation to his people. At right we see details from the memorial window adjoining the council room of the First Presidency in the Twelve, with the inscription, Holiness to the Lord, appearing as in the clouds above the building. The administration of Brigham Young encouraged the flowering of the use of the Holiness to the Lord. The words appeared not only in plans for the dedicatory inscription of the Salt Lake Temple, but throughout the entire territory of Deseret. As Elder D. Todd Christofferson described it, the pioneer saints affixed holiness to the Lord on seemingly common or mundane things, as well as those more directly associated with religious practice. It was inscribed on sacrament cups and plates, and printed on certificates of ordination of seventies, and on a Relief Society banner. Holiness to the Lord also appeared over the display windows of Zion's cooperative mercantile institution, the ZCMI department store. It was found on the head of a hammer and on a drum. Holiness to the Lord was cast on the metal doorknobs of President Brigham Young's home. In response to an invitation to each state and territory of the United States, the General Assembly of the Provisional State of Deseret passed a resolution on 10th of February 1851, approved by the Utah Territorial Governor Brigham Young a few days later, to provide a black block of marble to the Washington Monument. The principal illustrations on the stones were described by the First Presidency of the Church as, quote, a beehive in full operation in the center, encircled by the convolvulus, in other words, the twining plant with trumpet-shaped flowers, and with the inscription, Holiness to the Lord, Deseret. The phrase Holiness to the Lord and the motif of the honeybee come from the Bible and the Book of Mormon, respectively. 
Perhaps in this case, however, these elements were selected for the final design, not only because they were distinctive identifiers for the Mormon religion and the territory of Deseret, but also because of their association with Freemasonry, a fraternal organization which many of the saints had participated in Nauvoo. The use of these symbols might be seen as a tip of the hat to George Washington, who, along with many other prominent and ordinary citizens of that era, was a Mason throughout his adult life. It should also be mentioned that Brigham Young's father, John Young, had served in three campaigns of the American Revolution under General George Washington. What had the phrase holiness to the Lord come to mean to Brigham Young over his lifetime? Speaking in 1862 of his conversion, he said, Thirty years' experience has taught me that every moment of my life must be holiness to the Lord, resulting from equity, justice, mercy, and uprightness in all my actions, which is the only course by which I can preserve the Spirit of the Almighty to myself. What was the meaning of the phrase in the Old Testament? Basic meaning of the Hebrew. The Hebrew equivalent of holiness to the Lord is written as Kodesh la Yahweh. The first word, Kodesh, holiness, holy, has application here to something that is set apart from the world and is considered to be singled out as belonging exclusively to the Lord, often for temple purposes. Anything thus consecrated becomes sacrosanct, dedicated wholly to the Lord's purposes and under his personal protection and care. The thing or person referenced in the phrase is considered to be holy to or holy for the Lord. The Hebrew word for the common English word form Jehovah is typically, typically vocalized by modern scholars as Yahweh. Although the name is printed in the Hebrew Bible, observant Jews do not say it as, as it is written. Instead, as a matter of reverence, they substitute the word Lord, Adonai, when reading scripture. Brief, what, how is the phrase used in the Old Testament? Briefly, it was applied to people, not to buildings. As mentioned above, the phrase holiness to the Lord is never used in the Bible in connection with the temple itself. Instead, the, temp the Israelites were instructed to engrave these words on a plate of pure gold that was to be worn upon the forehead of high priests who had been consecrated to the Lord's service through sacred ordinances. To wear the plate of pure gold engraved with holiness to the Lord on the forehead was a divinely bestowed honor of the greatest significance and belonged solely to the high priest. It identified the high priest with the Lord himself. To further emphasize that those who enter into the oath and covenant of the priesthood today do so in similitude of the Son of God, note Margaret Barker's description of how the concept of becoming a Son of God relates both to ordinances in earthly temples and to actual ascents to the heavenly temple. The high, quote, the high priests and kings of ancient Jerusalem entered the Holy of Holies, and then emerged as messengers, angels, or emissaries of the Lord. They had been raised up, that is, resurrected. They were sons of God, that is, angels. They were anointed ones, that is, messiahs. By entering the Holy of Holies as part of temple service, human beings could become angels and then continue to live in the material world. This transformation did not just happen after physical death. It marked the passage from the life in the material world to the life of eternity. End of quote. Today, those who receive the higher temple ordinances also become, in their measure, emissaries of the Lord, saviors of men, in likeness of ancient high priests and kings, and ultimately in likeness of their Redeemer. Speaking of the figurative heavenly journey that was enacted in the ancient temple ordinances, Matthew L. Bowen has argued elsewhere that both the king and the high priest, emerging from the Holy of Holies, were both seen and worshipped as Yahweh the Lord. Consistent with this identification, Alma 13 specifically states that high priests were ordained in a manner that thereby the people might know in what manner to look forward to God's Son for redemption. Moreover, the reason the ancient ordinances of the high priesthood associated with the temple were given was so, quote, that the people might look forward on the Son of God for a remission of their sins. At Sinai, the Lord told Moses that the day would come when all his people would obey his voice and keep his covenant, thus becoming a kingdom of priests and an holy nation that belonged exclusively to him. A related scene involving sealing in the forehead with the Father's name is symbolically represented in Revelation 14.1. 
And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on Mount Zion, and with him an hundred and forty-four thousand, having his father's name written, sealed, in their foreheads. That day when all God's people will be sealed as saints indeed, fully sanctified and holy, is still in the future. This leads to a question about the here and now. Why are members of the church called saints, even though they are not yet completely pure and holy? The short answer is that members of the church are called saints because they have made covenants, not because they have already completed the process of sanctification. As James E. Faulkner explains, Holiness derives from being set apart, not from the character of the object in question. For example, the altar is holy because it has been set apart for use in the temple, not because it has a certain shape or is made of a particular material. Any use of the altar not in line with its prescribed use as a holy object is forbidden. Similarly, Israel is holy because it is chosen, not the reverse. Being called and set apart for particular divine purposes makes Israel holy, and that holiness puts them under solemn and divine obligation, the obligation to live up to the holiness to which they have been set apart. That the Greek word for saint, hagios, ind indicates purity, shows that there is more to being a saint, to taking Christ's name upon ourselves, than membership in the formal organization of the church. We become saints by being called and set apart for God's purposes, and we remain saints by striving to meet the obligation of purity that such a calling entails. As King Benjamin makes clear, Christ's redemption and our humble submission to him makes us saints in the ultimate sense. It is presumptuous to declare any individual besides Christ to be a saint if we mean by that word one who is pure. However, if by calling ourselves saints we indicate our membership in the church, our communion with the rest of those who intend to live as God's people, and our calling to the service of God, it is not presumptuous to claim to be saints. End of quote by Faulkner. What is the purpose of modern temples? We need to become a holy people. The Lord has commanded, Be ye holy, for I am holy. The purpose of the temple is to help every person who enters therein to become holy in likeness to the Holy One and the house that bears his name. The Apostle Paul reminded the saints of the connection between the temple building and our own selves when he wrote, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? The temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. In 2001, President Russell M. Nelson elaborated on the importance of becoming a holy people, worthy and prepared to enter the temple. Quote, Those who enter the temple are also to bear the attribute of holiness. It may be easier to ascribe holiness to a building than it is to a people. We can acquire holiness only by enduring and persistent personal effort. Through the agents, servants of the Lord have warned against unholiness. Jacob, brother of Nephi, wrote, I would speak unto you of holiness, but as ye are not holy, and ye look upon me as a teacher, I must teach you the consequences of sin. As temples are prepared for our members, our members need to prepare for the temple. End of quote. We need to take upon ourselves the name of the Lord. The dedicatory prayer for Solomon's temple stressed that it was not meant to be a residence for God, since he lived in his dwelling place in heaven, but that the name of God dwelt in the temple. In that temple, the final gate of the Lord into which the righteous shall enter, very likely referred to the innermost temple gate, there where those seeking the face of the God of Jacob would find fulfillment of their temple pilgrimage. This final gate was associated with the name of God himself. With this idea in mind, the shout of the people at Christ's triumphant entry becomes more understandable. Margaret Barker suggested that their words might be translated as, Blessed is he who comes with, rather than in, the name of the Lord. Consistent with his translation, such a cry, coupled with the plea of Hosanna, literally, save us now, could be taken as an acknowledgment of Jesus' role as the Messiah, the great high priest, one who, figuratively speaking, had the divine name sealed on his forehead and could bring those who were willing and fit to follow him into the presence of God. In the process of time, each disciple could, through obedience and diligence, become as his master and each servant as his Lord. For Latter-day Saints, the blessing on the sacrament bread foreshadows that supernal hope as it anticipates the fullness of temple blessings. 
Elder David A. Bednar, citing President Dell and H. Oaks, explained that, quote, In renewing our baptismal covenants by partaking of the emblems of the sacrament, we do not witness that we take upon us the name of Jesus Christ. Rather, we witness that we are willing to do so. The fact that we, are only w w that we only witness to our willingness suggests that something else must happen before we actually take that sacred name upon us in the ultimate and most important sense. The baptismal covenant clearly contemplates a future event or events and looks forward to the temple." End of quote. The teachings of President Oaks and Elder Bednar came above came to mind as I contemplated a particular event that took place during the construction of the Democratic Republic of Congo Kinshasa Temple. At the time, my wife and I were living in an apartment directly across the street from the construction site. We watched with interest from our apartment building as work on the temple progressed. We passed its future entrance regularly at an even closer range while walking to our meeting house, which sat on the same piece of property. Like some other reflections I've had about the temple over the years, this one came as I thought specifically about the difference between English and French versions of temple-related phrases. <clears throat> Through these experiences, I have come to agree with the observation of an eminent scholar of translation, Walter Benjamin, that, quote, a good translation transplants the original into a more definite, definitive linguistic realm. In other words, sometimes ironically, a translation may promote a better understanding of the original, in effect allowing the pure language that is beyond any particular language, as though reinforced by its own medium, to shine upon the original all the more fully. In describing the use of the phrase, Holiness to the Lord on LDS temples, President Russell M. Nelson mentioned that, quote, translated equivalents are used on other temples throughout the world. Since I was familiar with the translation of the phrase in the Louis II Bible that is used by the church in French-speaking countries, I had already imagined that the inscription in Kinshasa, on the Kinshasa temple would read a little differently than in English, namely as, Sainteté à l'Éternel, Holiness to the Eternal One. Imagine our anticipation as we saw the culminating work begin around the doorway in preparation for the inscription plaque. However, when the long-awaited inscription finally appeared, it was not what I had expected. Instead of reading, Sainteté à l'Éternel, Holiness to the Eternal One, it followed a literal translation of the English King James Version, namely, Sainteté au Seigneur, Holiness to the Lord. At first I was surprised. The translation, Holiness to the Eternal One, seemed to embody a more appropriate and specific description of God, because the Old Testament name of the Lord is usually taken as signifying that God is eternal, that He is and always will be. But as I reflected further, I came to realize that trying to describe God by means of only a particular, more specific name can limits one, limit one's worship, since, quote, every name is an attribute and all names refer to divine manifestations and qualities, for example, His eternal nature, rather than to His ineffable essence, end of quote. For this reason, many religions delight in studying all of the various names of God together, while at the same time looking forward to the day when there shall be one Lord and his name one. I also began to think about the sacred nature of the names of deity, that they should be spoken in awe and reverence, and should not be the subject of too frequent repetition. The word Lord, Adonai, was the one adopted by the Jews as a substitute for speaking the personal name of God. As the single exception to the general rule in Jewish law that the divine name should not be spoken, it was solemnly pronounced in a low voice by the high priest, standing in the most holy place of the temple only once a year, on the Day of Atonement. At the moment that the name was spoken, according to the Mishnah, all the people were to fall on their faces. Even though the word Lord is a limiting description in its own way, I began to feel that I could not think of a better word to characterize my relationship to him as I consecrate myself anew each time I go to the temple. He is my Lord because I belong to Him, because I am bound to Him in a covenant relationship, and because for the blessings of life and salvation I am, quote, indebted to Him and will be forever and ever, end of quote. According to Moses 5.4, and consistent with some strands of rabbinic tradition, this was the name Adam and Eve used as they called upon the name of the Lord in the fallen world. Moreover, the fact that the English word Lord, 
like the Hebrew Adonai, is meant in everyday usage to stand for the divine name, rather than being the divine name itself, reminds me of God's declaration when he said, in reference to the temple, My name shall be there. My name shall be there. Congolese primary children were invited to write their name on small stones, hand cut from the Congo River and painted white, to be embedded within the concrete of the Kinshasa Temple. The children at right belong to the Buima branch in Ba Congo. The Why The ubiquitous use of the holiness of the Lord in pioneer times served as a constant reminder of the future day prophesied by Zechariah when every person and everything on earth even the bells of the horses, would be fit to bear the inscription, Holiness to the Lord. Hugh Nibley, whose life spanned from the end of pioneer times to the modern day, became a sad witness of how the proliferation of holiness prophesied by Zechariah became a more distant reality as he grew older. He laments, quote, The greatest change I have noticed in the fifty years since I used to make the three-day bus trip from Los Angeles to Salt Lake is the absence of that thrill I felt when the golden words would begin to appear on the buildings of every little town, holiness to the Lord, overarching the all-seeing eye that monitors the deeds of men. That inscription was the central adornment of every important building, including a town's, each town's main store, the co-op, as committed as any other institution of the church to the plan of holiness. Next to that, what moved me most was the site of the St. George Temple in its beautiful oasis. What became of that holiness? Did it pass away with all the noble pioneer monuments all along the highway, wiped out by the relentless, relentless demands of a bottom-line economy? Those delightful old steakhouses, bishop storehouses, schools, ward houses, homes, and even barns have been steadily replaced by service stations, chain restaurants, shopping malls, motels, and prefabricated functional church and school buildings right from the assembly line, admittedly more practical, but must every house and tree and monument be destroyed because it does not at present pay for itself in cold cash. The St. George Temple is now lost in the neon jungle and suburban tidal wash of brash, ticky-tacky commercialism. One can only assume that it bespeaks the spirit of our times. God has said that the saints must build Zion with an eye to two things, holiness and beauty. For Zion must increase in beauty and in holiness, with no qualifying provision insofar as the adequate return on the investment will allow. Everything in Zion is to be holy, for God has called it my holy land, and that with a dire warning. Shall the children of Zion pollute my holy land? Apparently it is possible. Holy things are not for traffic, they are not negotiable. Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. Things we hold sacred we do not sell for money. Consequently, to become commodities of trade, the land of Zion and what is in it must be desanctified. The land of Zion must become unholy. What was consecrated must be desecrated before it can be used but for gain. Time and again the saints made a bungle of the superstructure, unwilling to conform to the foundation laid down in the beginning. When I first came to Utah in the 1940s, it was a fresh new world, a joy and a delight to explore far and wide with my boys and girls. But now my friends no longer come on visits as they once did to escape the grim commercialism and ugly litter of the East and West Coast. We can watch that now on the Wasatch Front. The saints no longer speak of making the land blossom as the rose, but of making a quick buck in the rapid turnover real estate. The students I have talked to at the beginning of this semester are not interested in improving their talents, but in trafficking in them. End of quote. Though the glory and holiness of God's presence no longer fills the whole earth as it did at creation, it has never been completely withdrawn. In a movement similar to the divine concealment that Lurianic Kabbalah terms contraction, the fullness of God's glory is, as it were, concentrated in one place, the temple, which continues to represent in microcosm the image of what will someday again become the model for a fully renewed creation happy in the divine rest of an eternity of Sabbaths. Until that day, however, the temple remains to space what the Sabbath is to time, a recollection of the protological dimension bounded by mundane reality. It is the higher world in which the worshiper wishes he could dwell forever. The temple is the moral center of the universe, the source from which holiness 
and a terrifying justice radiate to the dark and fallen world that surrounds it. Fittingly, just as the first book of the Bible, Genesis, recounts the story of Adam and Eve being cast out from the garden, its last book, Revelation, prophesies a permanent return to Eden for the sanctified. In that day, the veil that separates man and the rest of fallen creation from God will be swept away, and all shall be done in earth as it is in heaven. In the original Garden of Eden, there was no need for a temple, because Adam and Eve enjoyed the continual presence of God, and likewise in John's vision, there was no temple in the holy simple city, for its temple is the Lord God. May we heed the words of President Russell M. Nelson, calling us to greater holiness, not only as personal preparation for temple blessings, but also for the eventual return of the heavenly kingdom presaged by that holy house. For the complete article, please see Interpreter, a Journal of Mormon Studies, No. I, 26A.